I went to Paris just before the end of the millennium, and I attended the great Fauve retrospective at the Grand Palais. Some of you may have been there, but it was one of those events in retrospect which changed my life. So suddenly, I saw Fauve paintings. I'd never seen them. I'd seen a few in books. I knew who the Fauves were from studying art history. I hadn't actually seen these paintings in reality. And I was absolutely astonished. Everything about the way this painting is made is entirely different from the way Sigurd and the Canton Town painters painted. This was not painting as description, this was painting as emotion. This is a modern romantic painting in the same way uh, that Delacroix and Jericho and Rossetti would understand the word romantic. This is a painting of heightened emotional response to the subject, a personal emotional response. And it never occurred to me that you could paint sand or earth bright red. It never occurred to me that you could use a kind of primrose yellow in the sky, that you could have the ground showing through, that you could use colours that have come straight out of the tube, unmixed, saturated, that you could take every possible, what you might call liberty, and still produce something that had the drama of a kind of plein air painting, but with the emotional punch uh, of somebody who had been released from years of kind of suppressed emotion. And you probably know the story in 1904, uh, Matisse with his best friend, Albert Marquet, and the young Andre Durand, who was 10 years younger than Marquet and Matisse, they set off for the Western Mediterranean fishing village of Collioll, where this was painted, and for about two and a half months they stayed in the station hotel there, and they painted these pictures. The local fishermen thought they had gone entirely balmy, couldn't understand what on earth was going on. They got short of money to pay the rent. Uh, the proprietor of the, of the hotel agreed to take a number of paintings uh, in compensation for rent but didn't know, of course, that the paintings were going to turn out like this. So on the last day, <laughs> the proprietor was presented with paintings like this and um, was completely horrified. Uh, years later, the family sold most of these paintings and became very wealthy, as you might imagine. Um, this is a painting by Matisse, painted from uh, the window of the hotel uh, in the same year, um, 1904, and exhibited at the Salon, 1905, along with that Durand painting, and uh, that Salon of uh, Salon Tom of 1905 was especially famous because a critic came to the Salon and wrote about their work as he described it as the work of in folk, a wild beast, uh, and of course the epithet stuck. So what's going on here? This is painting in which colour has been freed, has been unshackled from a tool to describe a surface literally, and it's been liberated in such a way that it can describe an emotion. Colour becomes a tool for emotional expression, a tool that can express joy, wonder, love, passion, sensibility, sensuality, it's all there in the colour. By moving away from describing a surface literally, the artist has started to express something internal, something from the subconscious. The narrative, the traditional subject of the painting, becomes less important in favour of pictorial design. And one of the earliest uh, comprehenders of modern painting was Maurice Denis, who was a spokesperson for the Narvi group of painters. Narvi means prophet in Hebrew, and the Narvi group included uh, Denis and the Serousier and Gauguin and Vuillard and Bonnard. So it was a rather exceptional group that exhibited together for a few years in the 1890s. 
And Maurice Denis said, a picture, before it is a nude, a war horse, or any other anecdote, is a flat surface arranged with colours in a certain order. A picture, before it has any kind of subject, is a flat surface arranged with colours in a certain order. And this became the stated intention of modern painters, that the picture was first and foremost an abstract design. It was a division of pictorial space into patterns and marks and colours that ended up becoming a coherent whole. And it's clear that these colours owe a great deal to the mood and feelings and mental state of the painter, Matisse, and not a great deal to the kind of objective reality that you would expect a camera to record. Um, painted the following year, in 1906, Ardre Durand came to London and still with all colours blazing, he painted a city which in those days was engulfed in um, a semi-toxic smog uh, that was grey and grimy, and yet to Durand he reinvented London as this kind of saturated southern city, um, bursting with light. St Paul's Cathedral, rendered in French ultramarine paint with a little bit of cerulean in the most kind of primary colour, the yellow and the blue, absolute primary colours. And yet what's interesting about this painting, if you squint at it and try and make it into a kind of tonal painting, it sort of works tonally. The dark areas are still dark. So colours could have a strong tonal element. They weren't all applied with the same tone. The tones were different. So you can imagine the effect if you've been painting like I have been in a kind of post ticket Camden time way. You can imagine the effect that these paintings had on my sensibility. I was completely dumbfounded, inspired, horrified, and excited in equal measure by these pictures. And I wanted to do the same thing, but I had no idea how to get there. So I came back, and the first painting I, I tried to paint was, sort of, was this painting um, of Trafalgar Square in, uh, on, a, on a January afternoon. And um, it is still very much a traditional tonal painting, essentially realistic. Uh, the colours that you see, they might be slightly heightened, but they basically describe the surfaces uh, as I saw them and not as I felt them. The brushwork was a bit looser, but it was still a realistic kind of English tonal painting. It was absolutely nowhere near a Fauvist painting. And every time I tried to venture into colorism, I ended up painting this kind of English tonal painting. I mean, this painting, painted in 2002, uh, could have been painted in 1902. And in fact, it could have been painted, looks like, an early sicker. Still, strong brush marks, vigorous paintwork, but still all about the light and the shade a uh, very restricted palette. So, I had a crisis. <laughs> what, what on earth was I to do? I painted away, I piled the paint on, I squirted the paint out of the tubes, I tried absolutely everything to make my paintings like Durand's and Matisse's, but they wouldn't go like Durand's and Matisse's, and I couldn't work out why. And at the end of an immensely frustrating year, and after a particularly uh, kind of gloomy visit by my dealer, who was David Messon at the time, and he came up to the studio, and he was quite clearly completely puzzled and nonplussed and, and sort of horrified by the stuff that I had produced that year, uh, I decided the only thing that could possibly redeem this appalling work was a bonfire 
So I try and enter whole year's worth of work mm -hmm. out to the end of the garden and set light to it, which is why I don't have any slides <laughs> of that work. <laughs> Um, it precipitated um, a crisis in my marriage uh, and a general crisis uh, of one sort or another. And um, I remember um, actually knocking in the studio and thinking I'm going to throw the keys into the, into the pond, into the duck pond. In fact, I kind of metaphorically threw them, and in fact I, I didn't throw them into the pond. I kept them in, um, in, in the drawer of my desk. But I decided I wasn't going to be a painter anymore. And a few weeks later I remember taking my sons to um, see HMS Victory, and I was on the deck with my boys, and I bumped into a friend, and a friend I hadn't seen for a while, he said, what are you, what, what are you doing now? And I said, oh, well, I'm going to be a bookseller. And he said, really? I thought you were a painter. I said, no, no, I've stopped painting now, I'm going to be a bookseller. And for several weeks, I thought about how I might open a bookshop in a local town in Suffolk, where we lived. Um, but. I suppose it wasn't more than about six weeks of realising that I wasn't earning any money and B didn't have anything to do, that I thought, well, maybe I should open the door of the studio again, go back inside and, and see what happened. So um, after about a couple of months, six or eight weeks, I did go back into the studio. But before I did, I had spent a critical and another life-changing day in the National Gallery, wandering around, looking at the paintings that I really admired and trying to work out what it was that I liked about these paintings. And eventually, in the latter part of the afternoon, I've been looking at pictures for about six hours, what I realised is that the paintings that I was drawn to were paintings that were made with palettes that only had one or two primaries, but not three primaries. This was a sort of um, kind of um, sort of road to Damascus moment, suddenly realizing that the problem with color is if you use three primary colors, you are in deep trouble. You only need to use one or two. So uh, thinking about this, I went back into the studio and I produced the first painting that I ever made, which wasn't realistic in the sense of taking the light, the way the light fell, uh, the way the light fell naturally as my starting point. And if you really just go back a moment and look at that, and that is actually painted the same year, the beginning of the year, uh, as this. So this is what came out of my kind of period of crisis. And what's happened here is I finally found a way of moving from traditional linear perspective traditional aerial, aerial perspective, the sense of gradated tone, uh, the space is flattened, the real sense of space, the illusion of space invented by Renaissance painters uh, has gone, there's been a kind of slight upending of the horizontal, uh, the squares on the table are not graded as they would be in traditional linear perspective drawing, um, the colours are, are heightened and interpreted, uh, and the light source is a kind of all-round light and there are no shadows cast by the objects. And this was all stuff being done by the faux painters, but it was just that I couldn't do it and it was driving me balmy. And then suddenly, finally, I did find a way to do it. And started, this is I'm afraid a very bleached slide, it's a much uh, richer painting, but this was the cover of catalogue for my 2006 New York show. I moved to a gallery I was still with uh, 10 years ago uh, in New York and I finally kind of think I had absorbed the uh, events that were so imp so huge at the beginning of the 20th century uh, in art that this whole business of flattened space uh, and of making the design of the picture the central point rather than the narrative. Uh, and this picture shows um, my niece and um, my dog um, in a garden um, in Spain and um, was hugely influenced, the way it was painted was hugely influenced by those post-impressionist painters. But 
The day after my exhibition opened in New York, I went to the Metropolitan Museum of Fine Art and I saw this painting. Uh, most of you will recognize this uh, as uh, a painting by Bonnard called The Garden at, or the Terrace at Vernon, or sometimes called Decor à Vernon. Uh, it's a painting he began in 1920 and finished just before the outbreak of World War II, um, 19 and a half years later. Uh, it's eight feet wide, and uh, every time I've been to New York since 2006, I have gone to look at this painting. Um, Vernon was his house in Normandy, near his friend Monet, Giovanni, and uh, you're looking out onto the Normandy countryside there from his terrace, which is shaded. Um, the narrative of this painting is, uh, is complicated. Um, the woman standing at the table is Mart, his wife. The woman holding the fruit in the basket is probably also Mart, his wife. And the woman on the right is probably Rene Monchati, a woman with whom he had a brief love affair in the early 19. Uh, 20s, and she sadly committed suicide uh, in 1925. Um, and the figures on the left hand side uh, uh, are where well, you can see Bonnard down the far end, um, and I'm not quite sure who the near figure uh, is. But it's interesting that in fact he used, for the shape of the figures, he used photographs of Mycenae period. Greek statues that were in the museum in Athens. Um, the painting is painted over a long period of time, first at his studio uh, in Normandy, and then at his studio at the Cannes, uh, suburb of Cannes, where he moved uh, in 1926 and remained for the rest of his life. And it is a picture which has within it many of the ingredients, many of the finest ingredients of Bonnard's painting, his extraordinary ability to use paint in lots of different ways, this rich painterly language where the paint is applied sometimes transparently, sometimes opaquely, where the colours as they move from one shape to another change their tone, which allows the shapes, the big shapes, to remain whole shapes even where they're subdivided. It's an extraordinary palette of deep blues and violets uh, and these kind of golden uh, oranges and yellows. Um, no kind of primary red in it. Um, and it evokes a very strong mood, almost a dreamlike mood. Uh, it's a contemplation on these women who were so important in his life uh, and on his own uh, response to the world around him. Uh, to nature um, and well, the timeless business of living. Um, I can't think of any other painting, uh, any other 20th century painting, in fact, I can't think of any other painting period that has a tree trunk right down the middle uh, of the picture, right in the foreground, and yet it's so beautifully painted and it, with such kind of delicate sensitivity to the range of hues that he is using, that it is nothing but an asset, a kind of gentle shape where one can allow one's mind uh, a moment of kind of peace and contemplation before moving on to the very uh, colorist scene to the left. And Bonnard's work remained a huge influence on me and still does. And from that point onwards, I try all sorts of different ways in which I might use the paint. Um, restricted palettes, here you'll see uh, a palette of blues uh, and blue greys uh, and blue violets, um, but there's no primary yellow in this palette and there's no primary red, well there's no red at all in this palette, and therefore it has a particular mood. And I've continued to explore different ways in which 
uh, I can apply the paint to evoke the feelings that I want to evoke. This painting is more recent from my last New York show, and um, it has within it something of the Vienna Secession, um, the work of um, Klimt and Schiele, and their use of gold leaf. Um, somebody described it as where um, Klimt and Vuillard collide. Maybe that's right. Um, I think since that crucial period of 2004, 2005, uh, I think I've become much less self-conscious uh, and I just got on and painted. And I'm quite happy to continue to reinvent the way I apply the paint um, as often as I paint, which is pretty much every day uh, of the week, every week of the year. So it's a constant process of reaching out to find a particular language which best expresses one's own heartfelt response to the world around one. So that brings me to the end of the sort of the journey of kind of how we got, or how I got to where I am. Now we go to with Michael highlights. I mean, actually, it's a big exhibition, this, and I, I think there's only 12 or so slides. I, having abandoned the idea of painting out of doors, um, I've recently gone back to painting out of doors, to being on plein air, uh, and I love being outside in the landscape. I find it enormously exciting. Um, but my Bible is always the same thing, of only two primaries, and sometimes only one primary. This, in fact, uh, is a, a palette based on the complementary colours of green, violet and orange, and I've introduced um, a guest primary. I allow myself, if I work with a complementary palette, to have a guest primary, which here, as you can see, is yellow. Um, and this painting was made um, on the Turkish coast uh, at the end of last year, and was one of a whole series of paintings made out of doors in the very late summer uh, of 2014. And here we are on home territory. This was painted actually from memory uh, in my studio and is a park in Bristol uh, where I now live. Um, and there are a couple of chaps lying on the ground with a bicycle and it's the end of autumn afternoon and that very last bit of mellow sunlight which we experienced, well, we haven't seen it now for the last six weeks. Um, but once again, it's essentially a complementary palette here. Um, there are no primary colours uh, in this picture. And so it has a particular mood that is created by the choice of colours. Um, and here we are on the coast of uh, Dorset, Lyme, Regis, um, and I'm enormously attracted by um, these small sailing boats and dinghies in the harbour, uh, and the way their shapes bobbing up and down in the water seem to echo the shapes of the clouds scudding across the sky. Um, and this is painted outdoors, a small painting, I mean it looks sort of slightly monumental here, but it was only a sort of 20 inch uh, painting. painted in a single session, um, out of doors this summer. Um, and now we have one of the Turkish landscapes painted back in England. Um, this is a larger painting, three and a half feet, um, and it describes a scene at the end of the day, looking down on the small town where I'm staying from a path in a wood, and it invokes that final moment of the day when uh, the light is just fading, the sky is beginning to darken, the last uh, rays of sun are dancing off the water, and the dimly sun is catching, the rays are catching the tops of the trees. A particularly marvellous moment in southern Europe uh, in late summer. And painted with uh, a restricted palette in which blue uh, and a sort of slightly degraded yellow of the dominant colours. And we can compare it with this study 
painted out of doors, uh, actually in Turkey, um, with a planet that has got no moon. So we could just go back to that one. And he devotes a particular moon, and then we can compare it with this painting, which has an altogether different moon because of the choice of colours and perhaps a slightly freer kind of language, uh, which is urged on one by the passing of time when one's out of doors and in front of the subject. Um, another sketch made uh, in the same place, looking down on this town. Um, again, there are no primary colours here, um, but it is yet a colourful painting. Um, and we can compare that with this painting, which has uh, an altogether sort of karma feel made this summer uh, in Dorset. Um, and it's all about the play of light and shadow. Um, and again, a relatively restricted pattern. Um, this is a painting is not far off the size that it is projected here and um, is a, a painting about interior space. I've always been very affected by the spaces that I've lived in and they've become hugely important to me. Uh, and I have found increasingly that I will paint my own living spaces again and again and again. And this has a debt to Bonnard, as you probably notice, um, and most, most specifically, the way in which the outdoor lighting has entered indoors. Because of course, in reality, this would room would appear very dark in comparison to the view of the garden and the landscape beyond. But the whole thing in that post-impressionist mm -hmm. tradition with which I have a strong dialogue uh, has been about creating a coherent painting, a division of pictorial space into slightly flattened areas of changing tones and changing colour. Roger Hilton, the post-war abstract painter, a friend of Terry Frost and Patrick Heron and all that lot, used to say that if you change the colour, change the tone. And that has become a, a, a mantra for me, making sure that although I'm using unrealistic non-representational palette, that each colour is applied with a different tonal value so that there is a very strong energy in the picture surface. If you paint with colours that are all the same tonal value, the picture surface becomes inert and however much colour you use, it is no, it is no longer dynamic. Um, and you see here my dog who features quite often in my painting normally a seal. Um, and in fact, uh, in this painting, um, my dog is awake, um, and um, painting also made in Dorset. Um, my partner is sitting at her easel painting away, and she in fact is painting me. And I'm kind of painting her, but I got distracted by this huge arrangement of flowers all around me. There are flowers on the table. These, this jug of flowers that come from inside the house but when I put it on the table outside, it suddenly became a kind of new still life on its own, surrounded by the, the late summer anemones and the agapanthus. And it's a sort of mosaic of warm and cool, um, and of blues and yellows contrasted with these kind of dirty pinks and cooler greys. It's quite a big painting. Um, one of the <coughs> subjects that always uh, has always engaged me, and I think really owes its kind of original inspiration really back to the work of pre-Raphaelite painters. This is like a kind of pre-Raphaelite painting mm -hmm. that's been through a mill of post-impressionism, being given a dose of Fauvism, a dash of Bonner, mm -hmm. a, a little bit of Hugo Grenville, and it's come out like this. Uh, and um, it doesn't look like a Bonnard, um, but it does have that dialogue with 
what I think was the most interesting period of 20th century painting, early 20th century continental painting, seems to me to have within it a rich painterly language, uh, a very strong sensibility, and a sense of joy. Uh, and so much of contemporary art, there has been a, a, an emphasis to sort of suppress the joy, and move away from it. But I like to paint uh, joy. Um, and anyway, here is a kind of gentle joy, uh, if you like. And the figure is obviously reflected in the mirror, and the eye is drawn past the sleeping figure to the still light on the table in the background, where my strongest tonal contrasts are um, pure black against um, lighter colours. And that was a little technique that Turner taught us. He said, if you're going to use black, put it at the back of the painting. Draw the eye across the subject. And there is always lurking in the eye, I suppose, a kind of impressionist, and this painting is kind of near perhaps to impressionism, uh, although it has also within it some of the ingredients of kind of post war uh, abstract American painting. The paint is very liquid, um, and there is a very strong sense of kind of transparent paint uh, and an energy. I mean, it is clearly a figure uh, sitting on a chair with a vase of flowers. Um, but it has this kind of liquidity of paint um, that is currently something that uh, interests me. But a gentle palette and a gentle mood. And once again, no primary colour in this painting, but it's still a colourless painting. And there have been attempts to um, further reduce uh, the marks I make and to further simplify. And it was a study. It's really a small painting. It's, it's a study for a bigger painting. Um, and here we see a similar arrangement uh, to the sleeping figure. Uh, this time, uh, she's not sleeping. Uh, the colours are slightly different, the palette is slightly different, and once again the eye is taken across the subject to the back of the painting to the still light that is reflected uh, in the mirror. Lots of black in these paintings, and it's the black that makes the half tones sing. Uh, and finally, uh, some of a group of flower paintings. Um, I love painting flowers, uh, and uh, I think about a third of the paintings I produce are still lives that have arrangements of flowers uh, within them. But it gives vent for all sorts of journeys into uh, colour relationships, exploring the harmonies. And once again, this is a palette without red. Um, it's a palette that is clearly dominated by blues and yellows. And the earth colours uh, are so important. The areas of less saturated, less intense colour that creates the ground for the saturated colours to sing. Another yellow painting. I, I, one of the things that I've been interested uh, in doing during this uh, series of paintings is placing paintings I've already made on the wall behind uh, my still life. So here you see one of my Turkish landscapes that's hanging behind the vase of peonies and there is a certain amount of beauty. Is it a view through a window um, or is it a picture on the wall and the viewer is left to decide. Now we come to the final few paintings. Uh, and this was a subject that I became um, particularly involved in this big arrangement of flowers on the table in a room. And the room was an imagined room, and the view was a memory 
of a view that I'd observed from the Palazzo Piccolomini in Pienza, uh, a view of the Val d'Orcia. I saw a classic Italian Tuscan view. And somehow, uh, it kind of made me smile that these flowers that did exist, the flowers in the vase existed, the table existed, and the room is a kind of creation. And the window, my view from my studio in Bristol, is on to a parking lot owned by a company called Cheap Cars in Bristol. <laughs> and um, so if I actually put up the blind, I look at Cheap Cars in Bristol as Cheap Cars. Uh, and so it does kind of amuse me that um, by keeping the blind up, I can imagine and remember the landscape of Italy. And um, it's called Memories of PM in this painting. Um, and this is another version of the same subject um, where the colour has become slightly more abstracted, the shape slightly more abstracted. Um, it has a possibly a greater translucency um, and it's the paintings I think, I, I think apply in a slightly freer way so there is less of the narrative and more about colour. Uh, and then uh, we end with the picture that we started with, um, the last version uh, of these still lives with um, memories of the Italian landscape seen through the window.